I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. When Bethany and I decided to interview Phil Graham, we couldn't resist engaging him in a conversation about the graham litchie Blyley Act, uh, which uh, Senator uh, Graham introduced in 1999, and that basically removed the uh, Glass-Steagall separation between investment banking and commercial banking. And we got uh, engaged in this conversation that really took us away from the episode uh, on poverty that we were uh, discussing. So we decided to exert that and release it as a, a added in bonus for the aficionados of the Glass-Steagall debate. I think that's a piece that deserved to be there for the recorded history. Senator, you were the first sponsor of the famous uh, graham leach uh, Blee Act uh, that in 1999 removed uh, the Depression-era uh, law separating uh, investment banking from commercial banking. If you knew then what you know now, would you have done anything differently? Uh, no. Uh, I don't look. An argument has been made that somehow graham leach Bliley deregulated The truth is the same regulators regulated the same industries. We simply allowed well-financed and well-managed holding companies to engage in all three businesses to promote competition, which I believe benefited the consumer. Uh, President Clinton, who signed the bill, has defended it to this day. And the so-called subprime crisis did not occur because of financial deregulation, because there was none in the previous 20 years. It occurred because the government set about to lower the standard for lending, and so that over 50 percent of the outstanding mortgages were subprime mortgages, and when prices started to fall— and people couldn't sell the house for more than they'd borrowed, people started defaulting in massive numbers. The the cause of that was a government policy through Freddie and Fannie that caused a financial crisis. So, look, I've been wrong about lots of things in my life, and I don't have any problem saying I'm not as ignorant as I used to be, but The Graham Leach Bliley thing was not a mistake. And it's interesting because despite the fact that President Obama campaigned against the law, uh, Joe Biden voted for it, his vice president, and uh, uh, Obama was never able or never was able to lead the effort to repeal it. So another banking question, given that you were the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, um, looking at the chaos in the banking sector now, there's an argument that, well, why do we need all these small banks anyway? Why don't we just have big banks, even though that runs contrary to decades, if not centuries, of American policy? What do you think? Would we be better off if we just had four, five, half a dozen, give your number, really big banks? Or do do you think we need the some 4,000 smaller institutions? Well, Bethany, I, I don't know what we need. I, I, I prefer a system where we let the consumer decide. Uh, let me just talk about Silicon Valley Bank and why it failed and why similar banks have had problems. First of all, a Silicon Valley Bank looked more like a money market fund than a bank a huge percentage of its deposits, some numbers as high as 90% of its deposits, were above $250,000. These weren't people that were, 
operating a checking account like you and I do. These are people who basically were holding substantial amounts of money. Silicon Valley was paying substantially more than the market interest rates to attract these deposits. It had invested heavily in government securities, but when inflation occurred and interest rates went up, the value of those securities that were paying a fixed rate went down and the, the bank did not have sufficient capital to cover the difference. Now look, there were a lot of warning signs. Anybody who ever attended any auditing program anywhere would note that when a bank's got 90% of its deposits that are above the deposit limit, when it's paying above market interest rates for deposits, when it is growing like a rocket, and when it's borrowing money from the government to try to prop up Federal Home Loan Bank Board, in this case, to try to prop up uh, the um, its deposit base, there's something wrong. I don't understand why the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis of uh, San Francisco did not intervene. Now they've gone back and they've got all these so-called warnings they gave them, but look, they were way beyond warnings. Uh, action should have been taken. And look, when you when the government of our country spent more in two years than it had ever spent in three years in the pandemic. Prices were going to go up, and when prices went up, in nominal interest rates were going to rise, and anybody holding uh, assets with fixed interest rates was going to see the value of those assets go down. Uh, these banks, uh, uh, and at the top of the list uh, is the uh, Silicon Valley Bank, they were undercapitalized given the kind of business they were in. They were poorly regulated. There was nothing wrong with the regulations in terms of the power they had. The regulators did not do their job. Now, why? I don't know. Was it because the bank had a lot of political clout? I think his president was on the Federal Reserve Bank board in San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but uh, clearly, uh, it's, a, it's a problem created by the inflation that was created by government policy. Senator, I, I beg to disagree on your interpretation of the great financial crisis. I think that the subprime mortgage uh, crisis started in the private sector with private labels. And only much later arrived to Fannie and Freddie. Actually, Fannie and Freddie were stupid enough to hold the bag for all the, the banks that started the private labels and then started to get out when the problem started to be bigger. And uh, if uh, there was separation between investment and commercial banking, uh, some of the major banks will not have been implicated in massive security tradings. And that would have uh, made the crisis less severe. I'm not so sure that it would have avoided the crisis, but made it less severe. Well, uh, look, Thomas Jefferson said, good men with the same facts are prone to disagree. So you've got your right to view the facts as you want to. I have my ability to view them as I want to. All I know is Graham Leach Bliley financial institutions, by and large, did not fail during the financial crisis, the subprime crisis. The institutions that failed, by and large, were not broad-based financial institutions. Uh, uh, Lehman at the top of the list. Uh, most of the mortgages that failed were federally guaranteed by Freddie and Fannie. Government act actively promoted uh, a reduction in the standard for lending as part of a housing policy. Um, when the crisis occurred, I was at the IMF meeting in Washington, and the head of the Chinese Central Bank said to me, in one sentence, 
tell me what's happening. And I said, we loaned a lot of money to a lot of people who were incapable of paying it back. And I think that's a good summary of what happened. But look, there uh, different people have different interpretations. Uh, I have mine, you have yours. Um, but I think mine is more accurate, but that's just what I think. I want to add that uh, the financial institutions uh, uh, that uh, were touched by Graham Leachy did not fail because the government intervened. You're one of uh, the most aggressive uh, people against uh, cronies, but that was actually a huge subsidy that the government gave to the very people that contributed to the crisis. In, in the, as you know, Robert Rubin, uh, who pushed for Graham Leachy, went uh, to work for Citigroup and as a chairman, led Citigroup to a collapse. Uh, and he walked away with $100 million. So I, I think that that's not really a good record. Well, I don't think the money you made from running a bank had anything to do with Graham Leach Bliley as Secretary of the, of the Treasury. But the bill was not written when he was uh, Secretary of the Treasury. It was written when Larry Summers was Secretary of the Treasury and when Bill Clinton was president. And I don't think you would argue that either one of them were paid off. I don't think so. I think, look, you can like Bill Clinton, uh, you can dislike Bill Clinton, but he's very smart and was a very effective president. And Larry Summers is probably the most credible economist in the post-war period. He took on his own party on spending. He proved to be right. Uh, and he's got extraordinary credibility. And I, I, I wouldn't want to try to debate him as on Graham Leach Bliley. I know where he stands. I think he's right. And he can certainly defend his position. As usual, at the end uh, of uh, our debate, Bethany and I will discuss uh, what we think of it. I have to say, I'm appalled of his response because I think that uh, now you can be kind and say with age people forget, but uh, I think all his facts were wrong. Uh, is wrong the fact that this was caused by Fannie and Freddie? I think this is a rhetoric that uh, uh, some Republicans have put around. But uh, if you look at the data, you know that uh, the party really started with private label securities. You know better than I. And, and actually... Fanny and Freddie were the stupid guy who showed up at the party at the end and got caught by the police. And then you, they are blamed to start the party, but they were the, the late comers who were not even drunk by the time they, they show up. So I think that that is the irony. And also the fact even forgets the fact that uh, the, the Graham Leach Bliley uh, Act was uh, approved with the support of Rubin. Uh, and I double check. And Rubin retired, stepped down as a Secretary of Treasury on the 2nd of July when the, the Graham uh, uh, Leach Bill Act was passed in the Senate on July 1st. So he wanted to make sure that was passed. And so that was July 2nd. By October, he was employed by Citigroup that actually needed that act to, uh, cons to finalize a merger that he has already done. Because if you remember, Travis Group had bought Citigroup. And uh, that was illegal when the, the announcement was made. And they said, conversation with Treasury, we're sure that we can go ahead. Surprise, surprise, they got their way through. And then all of a sudden, uh, Robert Rubin becomes chairman with a non-executive position, no responsibility, but... $10 million a year for 10 years. That's a pretty cushy job. Yeah, I, I think I think that decision by Bob Rubin and then taking the compensation that he did from during his time at Citigroup and completely missing the financial crisis um, go down in history as some of the ways to destroy what was a once absolutely pristine rep reputation. He, he, he did a number on himself. But just to your point, I, I did, I really grappled with this whole issue of Fannie and Freddie causing the financial crisis and actually I'm up writing most of a little a little
little book about it. And just to add to your argument, you are you are absolutely right. Pri- subprime mortgages were originally called non-conforming mortgages or private label securities precisely because Fannie and Freddie couldn't can buy them. They didn't conform private label because they went through Wall Street instead of going through Fannie and Freddie. So even the very name of them shows you this was not a business that was started by 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 Fannie and Freddie. Um, anyway, and I've always found this a really important piece of data. So so I'll just say it, which is that the home ownership rate peaked in 2004. If mortgages, if subprime mortgages had been limited to first time home buyers, we never would have had a crisis. The problem is that they were used for cash out refinancings. They were used for the purchase of investor homes. But this was not a crisis that was driven by home ownership. It was a cloak for a lot of bad behavior. True. But that but that was not the cause of the crisis anyway. And then just a last note on, on Graham Leach Blaley. I actually agree with him in one little sense, which is that with the last exception of that last little mile of, of combining an insurance company, regulators had already overturned almost all of what made up the, the, the Glass-Steagall separations between banks and investment banks, even before Graham, Graham Leach Bliley was passed. So it, it just put a congressional stamp on what regulators had already done, with the exception of that last little piece of combining the, the insurance operation. And I've always thought, and maybe I should publish it on ProMarket, I once wrote a story for Vanity Fair that they that they never published, not surprisingly, because it is super wonky, but about how much right, how much power exists in the hands of regulators and how much they use that power to completely reshape the um, the banking system even before Graham Leach Bliley was passed. You should definitely publish on ProMarket. And actually, I want to invite some of our listeners, if they have done this research or if they want to do this research, I think that a fascinating research is how the narrative that is all Fannie and Freddie responsibility for the financial crisis uh, number one was prepared right away from uh, day one. Uh, even I was reading uh, economists in Italy use this narrative. So the, how the world this has sort of trickled down. Speaking of trickling down, this is really trickled down from somebody that pushed very hard and then and is still around more than ten years after the crisis and is really really uh, devastating in interpreting the crisis. So it would be interesting to know who kind of uh, pushed this story and how it got so much prevalence in a lot of the press and in other academia uh, based on, in my view, zero facts. Right. Well, it's it's hard to trace it to where it first emanated, but for sure, Alan Greenspan was a powerful proponent of it, and that might uh, that is definitely one source of its intellectual roots. And to me, the, the the reason is pretty clear, and it's actually makes me think a little bit about Elizabeth Pop Berman's argument. It's it's not quite not quite on point, but it is that the the free market types have not been great about being intellectually honest when 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 the market has failed they they want to find they'll find another narrative because dear god if you say that the free market failed then that's a intellectual reckoning that 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 people can't face and so if you don't have Fannie and Freddie as the culprit in the financial crisis then you have to say wait something went wrong uh, something else went wrong and it's really hard to look at that and say something else went wrong what was it and so the argument that it was all the fault of the government in the form of Fannie and Freddie gets you off the hook from looking at what what else what else it was, so I understand a hundred percent why why the argument got such legs. Um, it's just <laughs> it's not true. Capitalism is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarin, with production assistance from Utsoff Gandhi, Sebastian Berka, Chris Wheat, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for Capitalism wherever you get your podcasts. 